Good afternoon and welcome to celebrate the life of Dr. Jacob Needleman. I think it's, I've always found it interesting that until somebody passes, we don't know all the different sides. So we will be celebrating his life as, as a member of the spiritual, spiritual community, community, his life as someone who was able to bring deepening questions in the world of philosophy and the academia, and two people who can call him father. So <clears throat> there's always uh, now in gatherings like this, a request which is inevitable in our world today, which is to please put your cell phones on silent. So I would like to ask now Eve Hill to begin our celebration. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. It's an amazing turnout. I appreciate your being here. And um, uh, today, in the spirit of celebrating my father, I will welcome you in the manner that he chose when he was trying to make us kids laugh. And he would do this. How do you do? How do you do? Okay. <laughs> so I figured I'd try to start out with a laugh because even though today we're going to be celebrating, I think it's probably going to be a lot of serious celebrating. So at my father's brief burial, uh, very few people had a chance to speak, but not so today. On the program, we have eight scheduled speakers, one video, and some beautiful music. And we'll also have some time for those not on the program, I hope, to offer a few words if they want. And after the program, we have some delicious food, and I uh, hope you stay for that. Uh, so I won't say too much today, but because I got a chance at my father's burial to give a nice speech, and I posted the whole thing on his Dr. Jacob Needleman Facebook page. So go check it out if you get a chance. Um, and I talked about growing up in a household with a philosophy professor for a father, where questions were encouraged, especially the unanswerable ones. Um, I shyly asked when I was seven years old, what happens when you die? And I got a pretty good response from the Tibetan scholar that was staying at our house. Um, he told me to imagine a football and then to imagine that there was a hole in the football and all the air went out of the football. And he thought, he said, maybe dying was something like that. And looking around, um, maybe it is. Um, at our house, uh, it was normal for meaning and the search for self-knowledge to take center stage. But as kids, we also rode around the cable car and we played catch with him at Alta Plaza Park. Um, my father took us for ice cream at Swenson's and we made it to Playland a bunch of times before it closed. He made quarters appear out of our ears and balls disappear between his fingers and he always knew every card we picked. So I'll just share one of my favorite lines that he had from a lecture that he gave about 10 years ago in Boston. Um, he was uh, referencing Ralph Waldo Emerson's essays on self-reliance and he said, uh, rely on yourself, says Emerson. Be true to yourself. But what self? What self are you going to rely on? And what can I call the feeling that comes over me when I let that who am I question sink in? And thinking to myself, the self that I think of as I, maybe that's not my real self. Or maybe there's another self that's more myself. And how is it, I wonder, that the questioning of myself, questioning if I even know who I is, makes me feel more like myself. When I remember I don't know myself, I feel like I do. And I hear him saying to me, as he often did, you don't have to answer the questions. You just have to notice them. When the self announces itself, he said, it announces itself in the form of a question. This kind of questioning, he said, defines us as human beings. This kind of questioning certainly defined him. And it also made me who I am, 
a self or selves who feels most like herself when she's noticing these questions. My father, the search for the meaning of life was the meaning of life. With all that he had, he nurtured the seeker in himself and in everyone he met, his colleagues, colleagues, his friends, his students, and his family. I will always be grateful that I got to grow up in a household where these questions of the heart, as he called them, were not only welcomed, he considered them the most important questions in the world. Who am I? Why am I here? What happens when you die? Of course, the nature of these questions is that they don't go away when you grow up. They're always with us, especially now, as we gather to remember and honor my father, Jerry Needleman. Thank you. It's great to see all of you here and thank you uh, everybody for showing up. Thank you, Charles, for the words at the beginning. Although we didn't call him father, we called him daddy up until the last, um, last those last moments. You know, that was always who he was. Um, so there's a through line through my father's life, which um, I part of which I wasn't really aware of until just a day or two ago when we got a copy of a letter that my father had written to his uh, parents when he was um, a student. I believe a freshman in, um, at Harvard, and he had made the decision to pursue this life of studying philosophy. You can see the whole letter out by the Olympia there, but I want to read you um, a little bit, just a, a little bit of the beginning of it. And this is on Harvard University, Cambridge, Massachusetts, very formal stationery. Dear mom and dad, this is a tough letter to write for several reasons. There are so many things I want to say. First of all, I'm in philosophy for better or worse. You seem to have the impression that I'm here at Harvard living like a rich man's son, taking everything in the spirit of fun. Harvard, of course, being a party school. Um, you accuse me of having taken the easy way out, out of what? But then you go on to say that I'm only hurting myself. I've never heard of hurting oneself being the easy way out. As a matter of fact, I'm taking the hardest way out. It would be more than easy to forget that the life of a philosopher is fraught with financial worries, uncertainties, frustrations. It would indeed be simple to major in something useful like chemistry or medicine. You fail, however, to realize that I feel a compulsion, a duty to myself to go into philosophy, a duty that goes beyond considerations of wealth. Notice I said wealth, not money. I don't intend to starve for the rest of my life. And I know what it is like to live without money. Do you think I ever have any around here? You can read the rest of the note. Like I said, it's it's a couple of pages long. It's out on the Olympia by the Olympia typewriter out there. And it, it was really interesting to me to see that this through line um, started so early in my in my father's you know intellectual life. Um, and it kind of all made sense um, because every morning, and forgive me, those of you who are at the burial may have heard this already. But every morning I would wake up when I was a little kid in my father's house, our house, uh, at 6 a.m. to the sound of that Olympia uh, clacking away. Um, my father, you know, attacked the page every morning, 6 a.m. for at least an hour before he came out to, to say hello to the world and his family. Um, and somehow that kind of devotion has become, uh, that kind of weird devotion has become part of who I am. Um, I discovered a little bit later in life that I don't really feel awake at all on days when I don't write. Um, it's a big part of who I am, um, in no doubt, uh, in part because of that damn clacking every morning at 6 a.m. as That's how you wake up, I think I was taught to believe. So I, I ended up later in life writing a daily column for a technology publication uh, for many years. Um, it was the best job I ever had, and it made my career. I still write my son, um, Leo, a note for his lunchbox uh, for school on the days that he's with me. My son, Leo, is 16 years old, and he still gets a note from his dad. Um, but writing every day, if I, if I don't have that outlet, uh, it, just, it just doesn't work for me. Writing it helps me feel alive, and the daily note just gives me an excuse to do it. So thank you, Leo, for being there to receive it. Um, and lastly, I want to say that um, one of my father's publishers, Mitch Horowitz, 
wrote a remembrance of him um, in it, he's talking to his publishing company president. And he says, the man is over 70 years old and he writes every day. And Mitch said that as if it was something uncommon. And I read that and I thought, that's not uncommon. It's just what my father always did. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, San Francisco State University. Um, my name is Mohammed Azadpour. I'm uh, the chair of the philosophy department and I uh, feel very honored to be here. And I also want to welcome you all to, uh, uh, to this university, which was really Jerry's second home. Um, you know, I had a good fortune of, uh, <clears throat> I had some recollections here. I'll just jump around maybe. I had a good fortune of sitting in one of his classes uh, some years ago and, and the, the kind of love and care that he uh, uh, sort of exhibited to the students and the way he kind of invited them into uh, the kind of questioning that he mentioned and uh, the kind of thinking that uh, Rafe sort of uh, 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 discussed. Um, yeah, that, that was there too, not just in his home. He really brought his home to school and perhaps his school to home. Um, but in any event, um, we were very fortunate to have him for so many years. And um, my first time, I remember when I came for a job interview here, uh, I uh, had the good fortune of uh, having a session with him. And he was extremely uh, uh, warm and, and uh, listened to me uh, uh, patiently and, and, uh, and sort of... Uh, 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 interrogated me in, you know, in, in a graceful way. Um, I'll never forget that. Um, I felt uh, welcomed. Um, and, and, and that was uh, one of the main reasons I decided to join the faculty here because of, of Jerry. And then um, some years after that, I, I sat in his class on philosophy and mysticism. Um, so these are the kind of things that he taught. He tried to kind of uh, uh, provoke a, a deeper understanding more than just a sort of academic uh, reflection that perhaps uh, some of you have all experienced in the uh, in your careers at the university in philosophy classes. But his classes went much deeper, and uh, uh, um, he provoked the class uh, with profound assignments. Uh, I remember his. Uh, um, essay assignments, somewhat open-ended, but at the same time, very demanding. Um, and then also his incisive questions and the invitation to ask questions. Um, uh, that was really important. And um, he also tried to draw me, in, he knew I was sitting in the class uh, into conversations about uh, uh, Eckhart and Emerson. Um, he mentioned Emerson. Emerson was his uh, favorite uh, writer, philosopher, uh, and he, in any chance he got, he and brought Emerson into the discussion. Um, his account of the higher self uh, for him was uh, uh, brilliant. Um, and his engagements were always measured and uh, buttressed with grace and, and immense uh, sensitivity. Uh, <clears throat> something to, to really uh, uh, appreciate. Um, so a few years ago, um, I had a, a um, dinner with him, and uh, we went for a walk, and he asked me with great care how I was feeling, how I was, and I, and I complained that I felt sort of uh, time is passing quickly, and, and uh, I'm sort of engrossed in the waves of time. I, I just don't have any sort of... Uh, uh, time for myself and, and just all the duties of teaching and doing administration work is, is taking over my life. And, um, and I'm totally distracted by trivial things. And he said, he, we were walking by his car. He opened the trunk of his car and gave me a book, uh, Time and the Soul. I brought it here. Um, so he signed it for me right there. 
for Muhammad with a warm presence. Um, and, um, and told me to look, especially look at the exercise in uh, the seventh chapter, actually titled A Modest Exercise, if you, some of you may remember. And um, so when I got back home, I found some uh, quiet corner and, and opened the book and I read it in all in one sitting, but not a great feat as a small book, you know, you don't, it doesn't take that long to go, but it's a fascinating work. And, and um, in it, uh, uh, I was given a glimpse of what Jerry calls um, perhaps after Emerson, the higher self. Now I'm gonna go a little bit through what he says here. It's, it's really interesting and sort of um, uh, works, uh, works out some of the things that uh, Eve and Rafe have mentioned. Um, so in, in uh, chapter seven, Jerry asks the reader to engage in a modest exercise and imagine that, quote, everything that has happened to us has happened before and not only once, but many times. This is just a, a thought experiment, if you will. Yeah, so, uh, and, and, and some of you may remember something like echoes of Nietzsche's eternal recurrence of the same, you know, some, some things that are uh, popular with uh, our undergraduates these days. And, and of course, you know that he's aware of that and he's sort of trying to, uh, you know, sort of echo Nietzsche here too, in some sense. Um, but he doesn't mean it as a sort of a metaphysical uh, speculative Thing. He doesn't want us to just sort of think about, well, what if life was just uh, uh, constantly happening and, and, and uh, circularly uh, recurring? Um, he wanted us to kind of feel and, and touch the recurrence assumption. What does it mean if everything was happening over and over again? And this whole event that we are experiencing has happened before many times. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, through the uh, development of this thought experiment, which he does it at like three stages, uh, he um, invites the reader to imagine that all uh, her circumstances, actions, and inner experience, these are all three different moments of this thought experiment, are to be determined by and subject to an in inexorable destiny. Then he says, what now? Um, do you see um, what he then calls the glimpse of a capacity within ourselves whose importance it is impossible to overestimate? By realizing that everything is recurring, isn't there some sort of awareness, some sort of I, some I, some self that stands above or beyond this sort of uh, flow of destiny, this necessary flow of destiny. Um, <clears throat> he also calls it using uh, uh, drawing from Emerson, the higher self. He says, when you notice this, you notice that the higher self is not yet there in this, in the scene, in the scene of your life, in what you think, what you um, uh, act on and, and uh, what do you, what you feel? Um, awaken her, invite her to engage immediately. And then he says, this is a quote from him, time stops. We move, it seems, in slow motion. We may be in a situation that demands instant action or a battery of complex movements may be needed, perhaps to save one's life. A second is like an hour, and through it all, an attention exists that is intensely calm, immensely present, and alert, intensely interested. Rest in the peace that comes with ultimate union with the higher self, Jerry. I cherish all your memories and And lessons. Thank you.
Hello, I'm Tanya Silva. I am a philosophy professor at Bakersfield College. And that particular journey started here, San Francisco State, 35 years ago, when I enrolled in a philosophy class with Jacob Needleman. Pretty lost, searching for the truth. Needleman suggested in his gentle, wise way that perhaps my questions were important. At that point, I was still desperately seeking answers. But his gentle suggestion that the importance of the questions meant something changed me. He suggested there was a path forward, a road ahead that could be navigated by holding one's questions like a lantern ahead of oneself. Down the road I walked and always up ahead, I can see the blinding brightness of his questions. And it brought me guidance and a direction to aim for. Now the road ahead seems a little darker. But my questions, my lantern remain. And as the lines from a favorite song of mine so eloquently put it, with one foot on the narrow way and one foot on the ledge, sifting through the devil's lies and what the good book says, if I'm going anywhere, I'll probably go too far probably away from you, chances are, chances are. I would like to share with you some of Dr. Needleman's words. Um, why can't we be good? He starts with a biblical quote. He hath showed thee, O oh man, what is good? And what doth the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Micah 6 8. Enter Socrates. Socrates is the symbol and the reality of the work of thinking together. It was a work that was unknown to those around him in Athens. And it is a work that is unknown to us today. Thinking is an ethical act. And now I'll interrupt the reading for a moment to share. I had lunch with Dr. Needleman at his kitchen table a few months ago. And as we were cleaning up the dishes and ending, he said to me, tell me everything you know about Tibetan Buddhism. And I panicked a little bit. I thought we were having lunch. I didn't know there was gonna be an exam. <laughs> and then I realized, he wasn't just my professor, my advisor, my mentor. He was my friend. And he was inviting me to think together with him. But part of me really didn't want to because when you're thinking about Tibetan Buddhism, 
you're thinking about death. I know the prayer, oh, nobly born. So I sat there with him that day and we thought about that together. And so continuing on, thinking is an ethical act, real thinking, the thinking of a man, of a being who was born for moral action, but who is not yet capable of it, who is not yet able to be good. What Socrates brought was a work of the mind that is a preparation for morality, rehearsal for moral action. What takes place between Socrates and those who occupied the place of his pupils is an intermediate movement between moral impotence and moral power. What he offers us is a way of finding the stepping stone between a life driven by egoism and a life based on conscience. You do not understand what it means to be moral, he is telling us from across the millennia. You do not understand what virtue is, what justice is, what love or beauty are. You do not understand friendship. You do not understand responsibility, either toward your neighbor or God or toward yourself. You do not understand what real freedom is or courage or compassion. You do not understand what happiness is. And above all, you do not understand what you yourself are. You do not understand your own soul. Because you have no understanding of these things, and because you are not aware of your ignorance, your life is wretched and chaotic. You believe you ought to be good, but you do not see that you are not yet able to be good. Your being does not allow it. Your mind and heart are in the thrall of your appetites, and your actions are in the thrall of your tyrannized and tyrannizing mind. Within you, deeply buried, is an immeasurably higher force of thought and mind, a soul, yourself, which has the power to put your being in order and which can give you the power to know what is true, to will what is good. But as you are, these possibilities beat their wings in vain. The secret of Socrates. Come, says Socrates. What is your question? What is it you wish to understand? Consider it carefully. About what do you wish to think? This is already a very great and deeply ethical issue. What might we think about? To what end should we put the energies of our mind, our defining human quality? This is the first question of Socrates and the first question of man, the being for whom being itself is in question. How we respond to it is of immeasurable importance. How we respond to it will determine the course of our entire life. This is the secret of Socrates. The secret that Needleman taught me and one I strive to teach my students. And I'm no Plato, but he was my Socrates. And I am more because I knew him. I myself, all the world is lessened without him here.
And no, I'm not Bill Jordan. I'm Charles Ketchum. Bill and his wife, Dara, really wished to be here today. But Mother Nature had a way of making it impossible because they live in Southern California and the roads were closed. I don't know of anyone who would, regrets more being not being here than Bill. So, but what he did also prepare was a film, a compilation of the many sides of, of Jerry. And he was aided by numbers of people, his fam, uh, Jerry's family, as well as David Tan, who will uh, speak after the film. So we will see now what, what Bill had put together. of living, as I understand it, brings us the question of how to be human. That is to say, how to grow, how to be what we are meant to be inwardly, how to live according to conscience. You can put it in any number of ways in a world where all the external cues, all the external forms are changing. was conceived as an experiment in which distinguished artists and scientists could ponder the art of their own living. Not what things they have done and where they have been, but how they have learned to live and what is important to them. This question, how to live, is, it's an ancient question, but it hasn't always been the main question in people's lives as I see it. Other questions have taken precedence. For example, uh, how to serve God, how to study nature, how to be safe, how to be happy. But how to live, I think, 
points us to a fact that we have to start from zero, that there's nothing by itself that uh, we can turn to with uh, a kind of um, presupposed belief in. It was a question that uh, Plato asked, for example, over almost two and a half thousand years ago. Socrates asked it. A man I returned to again and again at sticky moments was Jacob Neiman. Because you see your, your lack, you, then you have a need, even if it's not the need you thought you had, which was for the great truth, you have a need to be in contact with yourself at this moment. And you see you haven't been in contact with yourself. At that point, you're in a real relationship, because then you can, you can talk to it. You're, 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 you can talk to a teaching, because you're not in contact, you wish to be in contact. You wish to be more situated in yourself. You wish to have what they call presence, be. You wish something, you wish to be. We're all familiar with the idea of God. It's an idea, uh, and it points to something that may or may not exist. I think it does, but, you know, but it's an idea. It didn't just appear automatically like somebody's like a rock or a stone somebody had this vision of the idea of god or the idea of uh, of the universe of a oneness and, and many in one or in the ancient chinese the idea of the yin and the yang the two the, the, the constant interplay of two forces in the universe this is an idea and the, now the head can figure out the conceptual way of doing it but it can never really understand it because with ideas to understand it you have to experience it it means you have to be immersed in it with your whole being mm -hmm. so it's a very big difference ideas and you're right there's been a tremendous confusion between ideas and concepts and therefore the conceptual <clears throat> mind has tried to do all by itself what only the whole the mind of the whole person is able to do and that's been a problem with our whole society both Freud and the Buddha and those who followed the Buddha uh, saw the, the essential step that you had to take in order to free people from suffering was to understand the human mind and heart, to understand what goes on inside of a human being, to understand, to see what is, a, what is the self, what, what are we made of? What forces direct our lives from within? What causes us for, to be in such a state of suffering? And is this related at all to what the Christian mystics say? When we, when we read, for example, in Meister Eckhart, which, who was one of the great, uh, greatest of the Christian mystics, when he says this very strange phrase, I pray to God that he free me of God. I pray to God that he quit me of God, that he liberate me from God. He's saying, please God, let me be free of my concept of you, which is standing between me and the real experience of what you are in me. So in that sense, I'd say it's absolutely, well not identical, but it's so close that some of the texts of Meister Eckhart, which we'll see later, all you've got to do is put in one or two different words, and it sounds like it's coming right out of the Tibetan Buddhist talk. The same the other way around. If you so choose to select one or two words, make them different in the Buddhist material, you put in a word Christ or God or something, it'll be very much like the Christian and Jewish mystics. Again, this is a great question. Why? What is it that if things are this bad in a way, if people, if the Buddha sees mankind suffering, and part of what he no doubt saw was not just the suffering and the old age and sickness and death and all the neurotic tendencies that try to deny them and all the suffering that comes from trying to have meaning in the face of things which absolutely deny meaning, uh, he also must have seen the tendency of people to hurt each other, to, to, to kill, to violate, to, to uh, 
non-physically even to cause great suffering to each other. He must have also seen the fundamental loneliness that people have and the fundamental uh, sense of trying to heal the, the loneliness by attaching themselves to something which is also just as unreal. See, there's something in us as an instrument or a capacity to see, which is not the same thing as thinking, that we could be called, use the word, attention. There are levels of this quality of consciousness and attention which are cultivated and developed and which really are the, trans the force that transforms human nature. So one begins to get a taste then of that I'm, I, I wish I'd be living with more attention. I try to write about philosophy and also bring in the elements of story. And it's not just a personal foible. It's my way of trying to present ideas and approaches that touch the feelings as well as the intellect. Because for questions such as the question of God and others, you need to have the feelings engaged as well as the mind. The purpose of the writing team is to study the work of thinking. And thinking, not as we ordinarily do, but thinking that comes from inner work. And the inner work is supported by the four or five people on the team who criticize each other and make us work with our ego in order to try to open to a source of thought that is deeper than we usually have. It's inwardly to see ourselves as we are in our relationship to our mind, our thoughts, and our attention.
David Tan. Just to uh, let everybody know, uh, the video portions of the video that Bill Jordan graciously put together, uh, much uh, much of the video from uh, the uh, inside the classroom. Uh, I almost just did the audio. The video was done by uh, by my friend, my dear friends, uh, Frank and Sally Gatti. So, just want to let you guys know that. <laughs> I was overdue in getting my master's degree, my master's degree in philosophy here at SF State. Jacob Needleman was the only professor available to chair my thesis committee. I came from the analytic tradition, uh, steeped in logical positivism. I had no interest in Jerry's exploration of mysticism or religion. Philosophy concerns facts and engaging in the real world. I almost walked out of the first class I had with him. But he has a way with us students. After receiving my master's, I continued to work for him as a teaching assistant for another two decades. He presented the philosophers with an approach that equipped us with an openness that would allow a continual epistemological growth that would last beyond college. There were many ideas and concepts I did not understand when I first heard them, but Jerry opened a door through which understanding, understanding would eventually arrive. In allowing any question, even those he could not readily answer, he showed us how to honor a question. This one technique of allowing an idea to sit for a while, a, a, what Plato calls aporia, a fertile unknowing, is the state by which, when the time is right, understanding will germinate into true understanding. As mentioned before, Professor Neeleman said that a well-thought-out question that comes from the mind of the heart is many times better than an answer arrived at too quickly. In continental philosophy, the self contemplates the not-self, thereby coming to self-knowledge. Uh, he and I shared a love for continental philosophy because they wrestled with the existentialist phenomenological experience of an individual being free in the world. Those seemingly avant-garde ideas, though, are connected to Plato's conception of philosophy. An ancient approach to self-knowledge introduced by Jerry as therapeia. So with this approach in mind, when Plato teaches to find reality, in the higher reality of the forms, or when Hegel and Schelling discuss thesis finding synthesis through antithesis, or when Heidegger says the study of being begins with the one being for which being is an issue, or when Arjuna finds peace through a deadly struggle with his dearest family, or when Emerson teaches that true individuality is found by connecting with the oversoul Professor Needleman says, these are all instances of philosophy's mission to help the individual understand him or herself in the deepest sense through the contemplation of the other. Analytical logic chopping could never act as that kind of mirror. Attendance was optional at the last class of the semester. Papers were turned in, he had no prepared lecture. Rather, he opened the floor to any question to those who chose to stay. This was to instill this main approach to philosophy, to entertain an idea through questioning, even if one did not understand it at the time. You can read about uh, one of these uh, after semester sessions in the book, Why Can't We Be Good? In that book, he says, a question of the heart is a moral demand. Don't let anyone ever discourage you from asking the questions that come from your inner being, because those questions are not only worth answering, but worth asking. And if an answer comes and you don't understand it, just let it sit there. In a question and answer session at a book signing in 2010 in Portland, Oregon, an audience member asked Jerry quite simply, but sincerely, what did you receive from Gurdjieff? The pause on the recording was 1.7 seconds, but phenomenologically, it felt like two minutes because of the weight of the question. 
The jury answered everything I know. What did I learn from Professor Jacob Needleman? Thank you. Roger Lipsy, a good friend of Dr. Jacob Needleman, is unable to make it today. So, in his absence, I will read a tribute he wrote in Parabola. Jacob Needleman, a tribute. Parabola has lost an incomparable contributor and I have lost a friend like no other. In Jacob's lifetime, everyone called him Jerry. I didn't feel it appropriate to explain to him how I perceived him. Life was ongoing. There would be change and growth. Explanation had no place. The situation is different now, and I should state what I know to be true. I won't speak here of his many remarkable books, Lost Christianity, The Heart of Philosophy, The American Soul, What is God, and others. They trace a life of sustained inquiry in which he brought us along with him. His books are there for us and will remain so. I should say something of the man. First off, he resembled Socrates, if the traditional portraits are to be trusted. A face appealing through radiance, warmth, stunning intelligence, rather than classic features. There was logic to the resemblance. Jerry was a philosopher in the school of Socrates, extending from the master himself to Marcus Aurelius, whose meditations he published in a new translation. Philosophy in his care was inquiry into the meaning of life and experience and into the possible scope of life and experience available to his students if they reached out. Philosophy was not a forbidding structure conveyed in abstruse language. It was learning to question, to observe, to know knowingly, to discover how to live. I sometimes envied his pupils. From whom would I rather hear about the Gospel of Thomas? Meister Eckhart, the cloud of unknowing, and so much else. Wherever he taught, it was a fireside chat. The fire was in him and he shared it. Alcibiades' portrait of Socrates in the symposium reflects something of Jerry's nature. Alcibiades compared Socrates to a traditional statuette of, statuette of Silenzius, a satyr-like god with little doors in the midsection that could be opened. I don't know whether anybody else has ever opened him up when he's being serious, said Alcibiades of Socrates, and seen the images inside, but I saw them once 
and they look so godlike, so golden, and so utterly amazing that there was nothing for it but to do exactly what he told me. There was a second archetype present in Jerry, a second affiliation and loyalty, though he would have humbly desired it. This also explains why I trusted him, why I knew that he could not betray the truth, not at all or not for long. He was Jewish, well-educated as a young person in Judaism, and he belonged in his maturity to the company of the prophets. Their light and example followed him, goaded him, made it imperative for him to state in fine language what he had seen and understood. The prophets adopt some people and make their lives both fruitful and difficult. He had been adopted. Jerry owes much to the teaching of G.I. Gurdjieff and to his primary mentor, Lord Pentland who had worked with Gurdjieff in Paris. Jerry was meticulously loyal, both to the teaching itself and to his majestic demanding teacher. His participation, both as pupil and in time as teacher of many, gave him an enduring center, a privacy, a community where nearly everything could be tested and known. This was not a secret restriction. It was secret openness. When we met or spoke, I would often begin, Ech, Professor, a nostalgic echo from Gurdjieff's book, All and Everything. Gurdjieff's hero, the reformed and wise Beelzebub would often use this throaty sound to express surprise or dismay. For us, it was code between friends. We were ready to speak again, ready to explore. Good afternoon. My name is Stan Teplick. Jerry Needleman and I grew up in the same Philadelphia neighborhood. And although we were about a half of a generation apart, we shared many memories and experiences being the children of first generation Jewish immigrants. Later, I became a pupil of his here, a student of his here in the philosophy department at San Francisco State. And then for over 50 years, I looked to him as a teacher in the Gurdjieff work. Dr. Needleman understood probably as well as anyone the role of philosophy and intellect in the development of consciousness, but he always urged us to try to find a deeper perception. He taught us that the mind, the thinking apparatus in and of itself was not enough, that a finer sensitivity of the body had to be activated. Let me, let me give an analogy that's been helpful to me. If you go into a Jewish home, you see on the door of that home, a little tiny box called a mezuzah. This is not a decoration, it's a commandment because inside that tiny box, there's a scroll, a parchment scroll upon which is written, handwritten, a section of the Torah, which commands us to put this on the doorpost of our house. Now, in order to be valid, that scroll has to be perfect. And sometimes it's, it's examined for perfection. Maybe the elements, the wear and tear of the elements have damaged the scroll, but more importantly, because it's transcribed by hand, sometimes the transcription is not perfect. Many Hebrew letters look alike. And so sometimes two authorities will, will disagree on what the, what the letter is being represented. Is it a nun or a gimel? Is it a resh or a dalit? Those letters look exactly alike in Hebrew alphabet. 
Do you know how they solve that, that controversy? Does anyone know? They bring in a child, a child of eight or nine years old, a child who knows the alphabet, but doesn't know the meaning of the word and certainly doesn't know the context in which the word is written. But that child has a direct perception of what that letter is. And it's that childhood essence, that, that capacity to be with what is, unaffected by thought, thinking, philosophy, or even a teaching, is what Dr. Needleman urged us to find in ourselves, to activate and to return to time and time again. And he spoke to us, he spoke to us in a language of personal experience. His language was not, you know, clumsily fettered by philosophical terms or psychological jargon. I'll, I'll give one personal reminiscence. We were at St. Elmo. It was the 70s. I was very young. I was struggling to understand what this teaching was all about, particularly what was being asked of me. In those days, everyone smoked. We were sitting out on the standing out on the veranda after a meal, all of us quietly smoking. Dr. Needleman put out his cigarette and then reached down to pick up that cigarette butt and throw it in a trash receptacle. And he did so with such intention and such grace and so unfettered and so seamless. And seeing that I was looking at him, he turned to me and gave me a little smile. And at that moment, I knew what this work was all about. And I had a glimpse of the inner freedom that was possible for me one day. In, uh, in Yiddish kite, when someone dies, we say, Sikrana Levracha, may his memory be a blessing. Well, it was a blessing to have known him. It was a blessing to have been his student, to, to have sat in his class, to have sat in a circle of companions along the way, to listen to him as he responded to people after a meal or after a work session, to read his books. But most importantly, it is a blessing to remember his voice whispering in my ear, Stanley, don't forget to remember yourself. And in, in his memory, I try. It's just amazing. Happy to be able to be part of this. I must say, I just, I feel, I think I, there's no words for it. Um, but I do have a few words. <laughs> One day, uh, Jacob told me the story of his first day in his first philosophy class at Harvard. He said it was a big class, and when the students had all settled down, the, the professor said, before we begin, I'd like to hear from you what you think philosophy is about. The long silence, Jerry said nobody wanted to walk that plank. But he said, finally, I cautiously put my hand up. And I told him I thought philosophy was about the big questions. Um, can we know reality? Is there purpose? Uh, why is there evil? When I was done speaking, the professor said, philosophy is about none of that. Well, Jerry graduated from Harvard. He went on to Yale, he got his PhD at Yale. And I like to think that, at least in part, his book called The Heart of Philosophy was addressed in part to that first uh, professor at Harvard. There's a little quote here from his introduction. Man cannot live without philosophy. This is not a figure of speech, but a literal fact. There is a yearning in the human heart that is nourished only by real philosophy. And without this nourishment, man will die as surely as if he is deprived of food and air. 
In this culture, we do not recognize that part of the human psyche. And once I asked Jacob if he knew any other professors of philosophy that might have that rare gift, which he had in such, such a big way, that rare gift of igniting that yearning in the human heart for real knowledge. I had, I had an idea that maybe I would interview these, these needed teachers and that that would be a useful thing. It, it never came to pass. He did give me some names. I had a few names of my own, uh, but there are four conversations on my website, three interviews of Jerry, one of him interviewing me. And then um, in the last years, I would often go over to Jacob's house and we would, we would talk about questions that interested both of us. So I have some recordings of those conversations. They were all unfinished. And I hope that someday I can do something with them. I was lucky to be part of that writing team. And um, sometimes we would talk about a lecture series. And the question that uh, what we would do is ask ourselves, what are the deepest, most problematic issues face, facing the culture today? And um, all the obvious things came up, the, the problems with the environment, threat of war and nuclear weapons, the loss of trust in, in our culture. Particularly in the last couple of years, there was a question that Jacob kept coming back to, and that sticks with me. He would say, what is a human being? And, and the point of that is that right now at this time and in the last decade, but, but right now in a very, very big way, the question, what is a human being is taking on an unexpected, a kind of unforeseen, kind of an inconceivable meaning. That is uh, with the advent of virtual reality and the metaverse and, and artificial intelligence. Um, maybe a lot of you read that interview between a New York Times columnist and that uh, artificial intelligence chatbot, Sydney. Um, as I read that interview, Jacob's question, what is a human being, took on a kind of eerie weight as I began to experience the erasing of that line between what's human and what's not human. And I, at times I couldn't tell the difference. Jacob was concerned. Uh, I'm concerned. I, after I read that interview, I was pretty much depressed for the rest of the day. It's, it's, it's as if it was clear. We have crossed into some strange world that we have no preparation for. years ago, Gurdjieff wrote, and especially in the West has lost his instinctive capacity to sense reality. Somehow I think um, that's entirely a problem that we'll, we'll begin to feel in, in ways that we could not have even imagined. I thought I would try and stick close to this five minute allotment. So I don't have much more to say. I, I would say, I'd like to leave you with another quotation from Jacob that, uh, well, here's one that it's a good one, which I, I forgot. So let me say this one in his book, A Sense of the Cosmos, he writes, we must begin to confront a mysterious directive offered by two of the most brilliant minds of the 20th century, Martin Heidegger as a philosopher and G.I. Gurdjieff as an awakener of the need to think deeply, to ponder this one ultimate question, the being of beings. 
What is the being of beings? And as, as has been made clear, Jacob put great store in the wisdom that existed in ancient times in many places. And here's a quotation that has to do with that. Here's the truly revolutionary aspect of this ancient vision. It is telling us that it is impossible for the human individual, for humankind to have real knowledge without at the same time joining the attention of the heart with the powers of the mind and the perception of the senses. That is to say, simply, that our being must catch up with our knowing. Sitting here with you all and listening to everybody and watching the film, it is not hard to say that for countless people in, the, in much of the world, Jacob Needleman Jacob was a, a beacon of light a beacon of light and that light will continue shining in, in his works and the books and in videos and but it shines most brightly continues to, to shine most brightly in those of us who were close to him i know all of us here it will continue to shine through us Fortunately, I was not allotted any time for words. But <clears throat> I wish to share with you all the music that so touched Jerry. Before I play, I think it's very pro appropriate and a great heartfelt expression to thank uh, Professor Mohammed Abadpour and the philosophy department for having made this event possible. We thank you very much. So I will play <clears throat> four pieces. I know that each of these pieces were especially close to, to Jerry. In the last two months of his life, when I would go to visit him, each time the number of words between us became less and less, but he always wanted to hear the music. So I would play. Sometimes after playing, he would look with an expression of understanding what was being, how he was being nourished. Other times his eyes were closed and I just left. The first piece is a melody, Kurd melody from Isfahan. The second is a Saeed written by Gurdjieff for his wife. The third is religious ceremony. And the last, which expresses the hope of humanity, Aryan Dervish.
invite anyone to share their reminiscences of Larry and the other comments. Welcome to your Sunday school. In any order you wish. <coughs> so, my name is Greg, and in the year 2000, I started a Gertie publication that did pretty well. And some of you know, and the rest of you won't be surprised to find out, that um, I had help. And there were two gentlemen who actually consulted with me on a regular basis on this publication. One was Roger Lipsy, and the other, of course, is Jerry Needleman. I remember driving up to his house, driving up these curvy roads to his house up on a hill. And I had an idea for a theme for a particular issue. And I couldn't quite understand. I really didn't know how to put it together. And so I would meet with Jerry for an hour or two. And then I'd get back in my car and drive home. And I remember when I got back in my car, I had a pretty good idea of how to formulate a new issue on a particular theme. And Jerry never um, told me what to do. He helped guide me by asking questions. And through his guidance, I came to, he set a direction that I could understand and follow. Um, so I thank him for that. I, before I met Jerry, I had a pretty good idea what humility and generosity was. And after meeting him, after sitting on his deck with those facial expressions that I still vividly remember, I now have an understanding of what humility and generosity is through my personal observations this man. Hello. I'm Marcia Began. Um, Richard said that Jerry was a point of light. So true. He was, even before we heard this term, spark joy, Marie Kondo. Jerry sparked joy, for me certainly, from when I first met him in the 60s. He was just a remarkable man. He was never, I never took a philosophy course from him. I, I sat in on many of his courses, but uh, he was my teacher for over 50 years of the Gurdjieff work. So I was very fortunate, um, thanks to Jerry's family, his, his children in particular, to uh, spend many hours with Jerry in the last 10 months of his life. And I just want to mention a little bit about that. Um, we, we read a lot of Beals above. He really appreciated it. It seemed to really calm him if he was agitated. Um, and we read other workbooks, um, publications, uh, various treasures that he has among all of his papers. And, and in particular, he enjoyed, if I would read his uh, drafts of his final book, which, of course, we're all going to be looking forward to. And I remember one day being there with my friend Andrea Backrack, and Jerry told us to sit on that couch together. He had one copy of his book, and we were to read it. And don't go home until you finish reading it. And we, one of us said, can we read it to each other? No, no, you have to each read it quietly. It was, it was kind of a wonderful day that we had with him. Um, and I, I would also read him the New York Times, which he loved. And uh, there was the James Webb Space Shuttle or Hubble, the, I don't know what it was, it's a big camera. 
and there were about six pages in the Times that day, and he asked me to read every single page. And I told him that the, the headline should have been A Sense of the Cosmos. And he, of course, he loved that. Um, we went through his senior high school yearbook and read the sayings that people had, had written for him. And uh, I found a report of his, to his fellow alumni for his 25 year Harvard um, class reunion. And it's quite wonderful. I don't know if it'll ever emerge, but it was very sweet in the way that he spoke about his children and speaking about his life up to that point. It was rather formal because it was the Harvard alumni book, but he liked that. Um, we said some Hebrew prayers together. We said the Misha Barak every time we were together, and that's a Hebrew prayer for healing. He always put his hands together and we would say it. He's, we said the Shema. It's a very holy and foundational prayer for Jews. You say it every day. As the time went on and his ability to speak diminished, he never totally lost touch with his work. Yeah, there was a point where he, could, he would speak about philosophy, his profession, but that sort of subsided, and, but he never lost touch with the work. And our conversations began to become limited to, to nods, to eye movements, facial expressions, and sometimes expressions that would re reveal surprise or uh, an agreement about something or a questioning. And I left one day, one late afternoon, and he hadn't been speaking much at all. He said very clearly, he looked at me and he said, come back. And he died the next evening. So I keep finding little messages from him in, uh, in my own journals, my own writings, and of course in his books, which have been quoted here by people. They're so touching, they're so meaningful. And um, my own questions just began emerging the, the day after he died. I'm like, where are you? I have this really, really good question that I haven't thought about before, and of course, now I have to Search alone, and some of us have talked about that. Uh, Stan Teplik and uh, and others. Uh, we've said, "How? What's our work now?" Um, so for me, it's I just have to search in deeper places within myself. But he was ours. We were so lucky. We had him for such a long time, and he gave so much of himself his warmth, not just that he was apparently a fabulous philosophy professor, and I know because I used to work here, and his classes were always full, they always had a waiting list. He was beloved, and he was ours. We had him. So may his memory always be for a blessing for all of us. Thank you. Well, I appear to be the last, and it's five minutes, I promise. <laughs> I'm Merle Cutler, and this is for Jerry. Jerry Needleman loved gefilte fish. I know this because I made it for him almost every year at Passover, starting in 1969. That was the year I came to his class at San Francisco State. I was new to California after an unhappy year at a university in New York. Jerry was from Philadelphia and, I believe, had gone to my dad's high school in Philly, the Lowell of, of Philly. I was, and still am, from Atlantic City, New Jersey, just 60 miles away. Close enough, said Jerry. He told me that he used to go to Atlantic City looking for someone who would change his life. 
funny, that's part of the reason I moved here. <laughs> I loved Jerry's class. It would probably be more accurate to say that I loved all of Jerry's classes because I took a ton of them in the next few years that followed. You've heard all the testimonials to his great inspired teaching. I won't repeat them here. But from Jerry, I learned the most important lesson of anyone who goes to a university. If you find a spectacular teacher, take everything they teach. The subject matter does not matter <laughs> at all. <laughs> I was an English major, but I like telling people that I minored in Dr. Needleman, because I did. But back to the fish. New to San Francisco, I asked Jerry, foolishly, where the Jewish people lived. <laughs> all over, he said. This was the California way. But when it got to Passover time, I asked him where all the delis were because I couldn't find any. There's only one, he said, and the deli people told me where to get the ingredients for gefilte fish. Gefilte fish is a gelatinous mess to make. And each year, my house stinks for at least a week after I cook it. This is particularly hard on my husband. But it was good, even that first time. And Jerry was thrilled. It had been many years since he had had fresh gefilte fish. And his enthusiasm for it made me realize I had to make it every year for him. Honestly, that's over 50 years of gefilte fish. <laughs> Jerry accompanied me through life in most wonderful ways. When my daughter was born, he was at my house the day after I brought her home. He picked her up and said, beautiful, and in his most Gurdjieffian way continued, look, a completely unformed being. <laughs> She's formed now. In my last conversation with Jerry, in which he was lucid, he asked about her. I told him she now subbed with the San Francisco Symphony, and she also owned a plant store. He looked at me and nodded his head, and that way he had to show approval, and most of you must remember it, it's something like. <laughs> Heart almost broke at that moment. I did divorce my, fa my daughter's father along the way, and Kind Jerry let me rant very hard not to express negative emotions when one divorces. Hats off to anybody who can do it. And when, a few years later, I met the love of my life, he had two kids and I had one, Jerry was thrilled for me. The fact that my love was a nice Jewish doctor might have had something to do with it, I'll never know. But I remember when, at one point in the courtship, I told Jerry that I had just been evicted from my apartment because my landlady wanted to move in. And at the same time, the same thing happened to my future husband. I told Jerry this and said, kids and all, we would be moving in together soon, and I was scared. Thank God, said Jerry, <laughs> upon hearing my future plans. It's about time. But back to the food. Chopped liver that came with gefilte fish, and the matzah, and the matzah ball soup. I started to get a little worried about the chopped liver when we both got older. So much cholesterol in liver, even organic ones, I told him. You know, Merle, he said, the worry that people have about fat is so much worse for them than the actual cholesterol. That made sense to me. I kept the liver coming. <laughs> After he married Gail, I wondered how the gefilte fish and the chopped liver accompanying the Passover care package would be received. To say that gefilte fish is an acquired taste is probably the gentlest way I can put it, but I had to hand it to Gail. She was all in, a whole lot more than my son-in-law who tries every year to please me by eating it. But when you know somebody is trying, well, you know they're trying. But not Jerry. Each year I came in person, or I sent, the Passover care package. Each year, I, as I arranged it, Jerry would ask, he'd even call me, 
on the phone and just say, now, you're sure you're going to bring the matzah too, right? You're not going to forget the matzah. I never did. I assured him I would. One year, however, I think I missed the mark. When I asked him how the fish was, he smiled and said, I see you resisted the urge to overspice. <laughs> Next year, I laid on that salt. <laughs> Many years later, as he sickened with that miserable disease, I increased the care packages. Mostly matzo ball soup, but anything else I was cooking came over, including the usual honey cake for Rosh Hashanah. His caregivers told me he really enjoyed these familiar tastes, so I kept cooking. Anything from soup to the last Thanksgiving's leftovers. And here the tale ends. Jerry Meadleman loved gefilte fish, and I loved him. <laughs> I'm Nancy McDermott. I was dean of the College of Humanities from 79 to 2002. I came to San Francisco State three years after Jerry joined the faculty. But it was really in the early 70s that I had a visit from my philosophy teacher from 1946 Northwestern, Paul Arthur Schilp. He and his wife visited me. And as we were talking, he said, well, what about your philosophy department? I said, oh, they're great people. I walked the picket line with most of them. He said, well, show me the list. He looked at it, and he said, Needleman here, Needleman here, there's your great philosopher. Get to know that man. Learn from him read everything that he writes. I got to know him. I learned from him. But I couldn't keep up reading everything he wrote. <laughs> Maybe my favorite, when I think about it this afternoon, the American soul, because I understood a lot more of it, the, politics and the history, constitution, slavery. Or maybe it was just because those first few pages, as I turned, I saw the dedication to my teachers. Jerry Needleman was my teacher, my friend. I became a camp follower when I'd see that he was going to be over in Berkeley or Oakland or the mission, I'd be there. When I found the interview that he did with Bill Moyers, I weirdly found a way to include that interview in every class I taught argumentation and debate issues in free speech, the rhetoric of the courts. I don't know how, but we worked it in. Jerry helped me in so many ways after I became dean. Students who were almost ready to go to North Marin or Mendocino to join the Moody's or a cult. 
secretary would help me. Students who were ready to leave school or refused to take a required course in the major or couldn't finish a thesis. A faculty member who was blocked in completing the PhD. He showed me how to help. Yes, it was around 1983 that I wanted my friend Walter Capps from the University of California at Santa Barbara to come speak to my opening faculty meeting. And Walter said, come to speak to that meeting? I don't know. I said, Walter, Jerry Needleman is here. I'll find a way for you to have time, the two of you together. Walter came. I was especially interested in the class he was teaching, over 1,400 students in his Vietnam class. And in the meeting that morning, I remember it well. Carol Wilder, Hank McGuckin were there. And at the end of Walter's speech, he just wanted to know where Jerry was but he promised Carol that she could visit his class. The rest is history. Carol and Hank taught the Vietnam class for seven or eight years. The last thing that I'll mention was close to the last time that I actually saw Jerry. We had this humanities club for elders. Once a month, I would welcome any elders in the community who wanted to come to the humanities club, and then they could also take a course in humanities on a space available, teacher willing. And of course, Jerry's was one of the most favorite class. And his lectures at our monthly meeting, the best of all. And this last time, because I had already planned to retire at the end of that year, Jerry was still upstairs after he had finished. And he had loaned me no, a wonderful photograph that I had had on the bulletin board to advertise the meeting. And I'd promised to give it back to him. And I went, went down the back steps to get the picture, the photograph. There I saw Helen, who took every class that Jerry ever had room for to enter. And she was, no other word to use, she was stealing the photograph. <laughs> and I don't know, maybe it was some kind of mysticism, because I don't know what happened. But I went over, I just remember having my arm around her and saying, let's, I don't know what I said, but anyway, we went back up. I was holding the photograph, and Jerry expected I was going to give it to him. And I don't know. I don't know what happened. But <laughs> magically, mystically, he signed the photograph to Helen. And another lifetime camp follower, acolyte, student forever. I can't tell you how much it means to me to have spent this part of this afternoon with all of you, people who so clearly learn from 
and loved Jerry Needleman, my own teacher, my friend. Thank you very much. not likely will have the filter here. <laughs>